truth. I'm un I'm un I'm un Unforbidden Truth. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. On this week's episode, I'll be speaking with convicted murderer Jamar Russell. On December 11th, 2010, Jamar shot and killed 28-year-old James Lamont Tinsley. Jamar was convicted of first-degree murder and possession of a firearm. He was sentenced to life in prison, all but 50 years suspended. Here's my interview with Jamar Russell. Let's start off with talking about your childhood. Where were you born? Born in Washington, D.C. Um, we all lived on, well, when I say we all, it's like my family, um, Georgia Avenue, uh, my grandmother's house. So I lived there for maybe the first six, six or seven years. Then we moved out to Pyesville, Maryland in PG County to an area called Chillum. They're there for like another seven years. And, um, Moved back to Grandma House on Georgia Avenue. Then I was down in Virginia for a year with my aunt and uncle um, in Dale City. And then I moved to Riverdale for a little while before I moved out to Lowell, which was where I was last, Lowell, Merlin, PG County. Can you recall your first positive memory as a child? First positive memory. Well, I don't know. I had it. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, as a child, everything seems kind of cool. Like, um, I remember. See, where we lived on Georgia Avenue, my grandmother also had a house around the corner on Ninth and Webster. So I even remember like having uh, birthday parties in the back of that house. Like there was parties and stuff in the basement, stuff like that. And we have a pretty large family. Like, even my cousin is helping me with uh, this call. Like, his brothers and sisters might be around, his mom, um, my other cousin. So everything was cool. I mean, just growing up, having family around, a lot of love, different family from out of state, stuff like that. We traveled. Um, you know, I had a, I would say, a pretty good childhood, different different things that I was blessed to be able to do, like travel a lot, especially because my, you know, my mom would go. I got family in Jersey. I spend my summers up there sometimes. Uh, Mom's been able to take me to the Bahamas, take me skiing, you know, our liberty, different little things that was highlights and even other things that she might have had me involved in that was um, more local. But the church was a couple doors down. And even when we start going to another church, you know, just a lot of things that kept me involved with stuff. And then one of the things that was tradition for like years was Easter Mondays at the zoo, <laughs> which was uh, something that we probably did for like 20 years up until, you know, I came up in here. So, you know, it was just, I mean, everything was all right as far as I was concerned. Like, you don't, I didn't have a perspective of uh, hardships and stuff like that as far as when I was a child. There were things that was that definitely stood out. Like um, at this time, because I was, you know, coming up in the 90s, it was that whole city under siege thing with the crack. So, of course, addiction and stuff, you get to see that. Um, that was in the house. So, actually, my father dealt with that. So, that wasn't in my household because he was up Jersey. but. I had witnessed some things with some other family members, stuff like that. And then other things as far as violence in D.C., like, you know, guy two doors down, they got killed. And that was like when I was young, it's like, man, what's that about? But as I get older and, like, look back, I see how all of that stuff had an effect on things. But other than that, like, not realizing all of what that is, though it may have had its effect on the environment, as children, it's more so school, play, stuff like that. I don't think um, you start really noticing things as far as what you may or may not have until, like, you're dealing with school and people bring up whatever's going on with fashion and 
you know. So that's mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the things that I can remember as far as childhood. Of course, it was other stuff, but I mean, childhood was cool. Can you recall your first negative memory that happened as a child? Well, like I told you, I'm not sure if that was the first thing, but uh, like I said, a guy got shot through those down from my grandmother's house. My uncle Mike got killed, which was my grandmother's brother. And like stuff like that, it's, it's kind of different because it's not just somebody passing away, you know, somebody getting killed and like in our area. You know, PCP is a thing, too. So I think that was kind of the cause of what Uncle Mike got stabbed from. And something else that kind of, like, stood out was, like, going to school one day. My man Anthony Page, he was crossing the street, and he got hit by a car, which he ended up dying. And, like, we was together. Like, I barely had my foot off the curve when that type of stuff happened. I mean, when that thing happened. So, you know, just those are the things that kind of stood out. As far as my childhood and this, uh, you know, uh, other things that I observed as far as the effects of drugs that had on people or family members. So, you said that you basically grew up with your grandmother or your grandparents. Did you see your mom and dad growing up? Oh, no, nah, like, I'm my mother's only, so I've always pretty much been with my mom for a while, but we all lived at grandma's house at it. We was, uh, me and my mom, we ended up having an apartment out in Highsville for a little while until we had to leave, and then we went back to grandma's. Well, I went back to grandma's, uh, you know, and I, that's when things was a little bit different. But, uh, like, I, I was there, then I was down for Virginia, and then staying with my aunt and stuff over there. But um, my father... My father was in Camden, New Jersey, so I never uh, stayed with him. I would go and visit, you know. Um, he's passed away, but my father dealt with his own issues, things like that. But even being up there to go with his family, like his family was, they was around. They was, you know, it was love. So. Did you suffer any childhood abuse or trauma growing up? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. Nothing from family. The only thing that I say is like, I mean, this young guy moving around, I fought, but not no abuse or anything like that. If you want to say trauma, as far as like what I told you, I experienced, you know, with certain things as far as death, you know, with my man Anthony Page, things like that, you know, just make you realize that how life is. It's not really. Like, once you're gone, you're gone. But, um, nah, um, nothing to where I could say anything was abuse. It might have been some things that I ain't like, but <laughs> not nothing to the extreme of uh, some people get beat, some people get, you know, molested or anything like that. What was your behavior like in school, more so during your middle school and high school years? Well, um, for an honor roll student, for the most part, um, that year that we had to, you know, leave our apartment, that was like the roughest, um, you know, because it was basically a eviction and financial things. Those were kind of the times where I started recognizing certain things as far as financial hardships that my mother was facing. And, you know, I think I had entered like more of a depression around that time because I used to smoke and drink with the seniors before school, and that was my freshman year. So that was probably the worst year that I had academically, you know. And then also where it seemed like um, baby moms couldn't take care of everything, which was, you know, very naive of me, I mean, to think that. But as a child, 14 at the time, you know, car, get repossessed, get an eviction, stuff like that. It just looked different, like maybe she couldn't. But, you know, and that kind of kind of made things change for me as far as the direction in which I went. I still, uh, after that year, when I went down to Virginia, got back on track as far as my grades. But, you know, 
think I started okay. to when I started to deal with meddling and hustling and drug and alcohol use a little bit more. Have you been diagnosed with any mental illnesses? No. Nah. I don't see the psych up here because I'm in prison, man. This place is crazy. The guy say I'm fine. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I feel like the dude, you know, the one who flew over the cuckoo's nest or something. Like, how can I be in the same asylum and I not be crazy? But, nah, I'm fine as far as I know. Like I said, there's been times in my life that I've definitely experienced depression, and I've realized that now I've been in a dark place for whatever the reasons were. But, no, I haven't. Did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? Um, yeah, like I started started hustling. What about fifteen? Um, selling drugs, probably before that little minor stuff like stealing and things of that nature. But um, nothing, nothing really to talk about. Um, I never had a juvenile record. Um, thankfully, um. But yeah, that's pretty much that. Did you have a criminal record as an adult prior to the case that landed you in prison that you're serving time for now? Yeah, um, drug charges, possession with intent charges, things uh, around that nature. Did you do any jail or prison time? Just short, uh, sixties. What was it like? 90 days, yeah, I got set back for a probation violation in D.C. Um, and in the 90-day situation in uh, Howard County, actually three months before this, I was in there for that. And uh, another situation in which I had to do some house arrests and a couple days in Jennifer Road in Anne Arundel County to satisfy that situation. But... Nothing major. This has been my first major incarceration. Let's talk about the crime that you're currently in prison for. On December 11th, 2011, James Tinley was shot to death. Can you walk me through everything that led up to the incident and what followed after the fact? Well, um, that particular night, right? Uh, I mean, like, the history with me and Mr. Tinsley, I don't think it was bad to which we had issues like that. He wasn't my favorite person, but he wasn't the enemy neither. You know, you know, he just people that differ. Um, he was actually around because of a friend, uh, a mutual acquaintance. So that night, which he wasn't even out with us initially, um, I went out one of my people's uh, sister was supposed to came down from Jersey and I wanted to check her out. So went out that night um, and took some ecstasy before I even went out. It was the last of what I had. It was in the bag, which was actually more so the powder than the pill of anything. So um, went out to have a good time, social at the Applebee's, started drinking, eating a little bit, waiting until... I actually learned that she wasn't actually coming down and the family wasn't showing up, but her brother actually worked at the Applebee's. So we, uh, you know, just waited until he got off. Me and my, my, my man that stayed in the building. And then we, after he got off, it's like, man, we shoot over to this other little spot, which was the Rio Bar and Grill, which, you know, continued to drink and stuff. Was, um, thought that there was another young lady who was supposed to come over there that I had knew and was going to possibly meet up with her, but that wasn't the case. So um, we just was having a good time. Then before I know it, uh, the mutual friend had told me, like, the guy, Mr. Tinsley, who went by Buddha, was like, your man at the door. And so by this time, with the alcohol and the ecstasy, I'm feeling good. I'm, like, in a real good mood. So I go to the door, greet him, help him get in there, you know, uh, the guy was trying to charge him 20 which he didn't charge us that at the door. So I helped him get the price down. He was trying to charge him also to check his coat. So I gave him my car key. He was like, look, man, just put your, your coat in my car. Like I said, I was feeling real good. And it, 
was enjoying myself. Um, I know at some point at that night, I guess he was talking to me um, about getting money. And I was like, eh. he was like something my, my, went by Biz out there. He was like, Biz, I see you getting money. I'm getting money too. And I was like, man, you ain't getting no fucking money. And when I said that, I realized I heard his pride. So it was like I tried to apologize for it. And I think some of this that came up is because like a week before, our mutual friend, it was his birthday. And we had been at a strip club and, you know, threw a lot of money around and things like that. So maybe they talked about that. I don't even know why the conversation was like that because I tried, you know, and there was women around and all that other stuff. That wasn't really where my focus was. So I may have had a little bit of money. It wasn't what I considered money at all. And that's one of the things I tried to clear it up with and was like, look, man, I ain't say you ain't getting no money because I ain't really getting no money. But by that time, his, you know, his pride was wounded and he wasn't really trying to hear that. So fast forward a little bit later, mind you, I told you that his coat was in my car. So that's why I dropped off my people's. You know, I told him to come ahead and ride with me. I wanted to smooth things out with him. You know, he, his coat was in the car and we was going to the neutral spot, which, well, we weren't. I was going, you know, in the house. Like, um, my girlfriend at the time, she worked late, so she would have got home around that time. Um, and he was going to our mutual friend's apartment. We happened to be in the building. I gave him a ride, you know, after my people's got out the car because I ain't want to talk in front of him, you know, I try to apologize to him, get make sure everything's straight. But when we got out the car and I was about to go into the apartment, he talking about he wanted to see me, which meant he wanted to fight me. And like I told you, I'm got this ecstasy in my system, this alcohol, I'm feeling great. I'm like, fight, like what? I thought that that whole conversation on the car, but maybe I was so out of it that I didn't read the signs that he was still mad about whatever. And, you know, it oblivious to the fact. So by this time, I guess uh, he's talking. I'm still trying to talk, talk him down, not really trying to do anything. About to try to go into the house and, you know, make love to my woman. Like, fighting ain't even on my mind. Um, Mind you, at the time, too, it's like the holiday season. This is 2010. It's recession, all this other stuff. So I'm really just trying to stay out of trouble. I was in court for something that morning dealing with some traffic stuff. I ain't want any more legal issues for the year. Um, so I see that that isn't getting nowhere. So I'm like, maybe we fight, you know, that'd be the end of it. Drunk thinking. Um, so we get into, you know, supposedly in, uh, a few times and stuff like that. My memory of the night wasn't all that good because of my intoxication. Um, the guys that was there, you know, eventually pulled up. It was another guy with the guy that stayed in the building, broke it up a few times, stuff like that. I just remember at towards the end of that when I was about to go in the house or whatever. And so uh, I think he was saying something, and I was he was like, look at your mouth, look at something. I was like, look at yours, whatever. And... I ain't really about all that taunting stuff and all that other stuff. So I was just like, look, man, because I lived there. I ain't know where this guy lived at. I know about the area and stuff like that. But because of the life that I was living with and stuff like that, I ain't feel safe with him coming around no more. I was just like, man, look, just don't come around here no more. So that's when he was like, man, stop calling me out my name, calling me a bitch and all this other stuff, getting real disrespectful. So I was like, yeah, all right, I got your bitch. So he was like, all right, well, go get your pistol, bitch. And, like, between that two, those two things in which he said out of his mouth, it's like a snap, you know. I just seen red because in my mind, it's like, hold on, what the fuck? You know, so next thing I knew, you know, where I was and where the apartment was wasn't a short distance. It's like I kind of flew, <laughs> kind of flew, opened up the door, you know, grabbed the jump. And before I know it, I was back saying his name, and what happened happened. It's just uh, it's unfortunate, you know, because none of that was supposed to happen. Like, I didn't bring him to the apartment to do that to him. I didn't even set out that night to 
commit any act of violence. Like, I'm not a violent person. You get the chance to look at my arrest records, you won't see a history of violence, you know, but it was a bad combination of a lot of things. Like, we just fought. Now you're a threat. You disrespect me, calling me a bitch. Then tell me to go get my pistol, and it's like, what the fuck? And see, I've been robbed and things like that in the past. Like, you ask about traumatic stuff that happened as a child, but as an adult, you know, I've had the pistol on the back of my head. I've had, you know, guns pointed at me where I'm running away thinking that I'm about to get shot. Um, so I don't play life lightly with any of that. And so I'm thinking that, like, okay, and I also know how group behavior is. Like, if people feel like there's a weakness, then they'll attack. Like, I was the one that had a little bit of money at the time. He didn't. So it was like, potentially that could have been something that came after that. I didn't get into all of that thinking at the time because it was just an in-the-moment type thing. And like I said, it was one of those things that was very unfortunate because it cost two people their lives. Um, at one of the hearings, I got to speak here, his daughter speak this. I didn't even know much about his children, didn't even know he had children at the time. And it was just like a terrible thing. Hearing his mother cry at trial and stuff, it was just like... When you went into the house and when you came back out, did you two exchange any words or did you shoot him upon coming out of the house? Uh, like, I had a pistol at the door because sometimes I used to be paranoid about getting robbed. I didn't have it on me that night because I, was, I didn't set out to be doing anything. But, no, nah, there was no words. It's just, like I said, when I came back to get his attention, I, that was it. You know, I was involved in, in selling drugs and things of that nature. And like I said, the time was the recession. Like, there's guys that I know, do, and like even the Lowell area, which I could say it was a nice part of PG County, that was even getting killed. And like some of the guys that I would see because of the stuff that I was involved in, some of them would be asking for licks. And I mean, if you don't know what that means, that means like robberies and put them on people and stuff. So my... My mind is to always be on guard, and it's kind of almost like a paranoia when you're dealing with that life because, you know, I've been in situations where there's people that I consider friends, you know, that may have set me up and things of that nature. Like, I wrote a story in this book called Lessons of the Game that was put out by uh, Mike and Domingo that kind of really described about little stuff that was going on around that time a short, you know, short story and stuff like that, but was really based on my life. And there's certain things that, like, even with my writing, it kind of tells you, and people that have actually lived that life and stuff, they know about the anxiety and everything that goes along with that. So I didn't want it to seem like, oh, just, oh, it was a fight and stuff like that. Yeah, the drugs and alcohol all all played a mix into the poor decision-making. But then there's also you know, how predatory, like, street life is. Just like how prison is where I'm at. Everything is very predatory. Like, people pray on the weekend, and if they think that you're weak or anything, then you fool. And so in a situation like that, with already being conditioned to things, knowing that if that guy was to, you know, he felt like he could do whatever to me and I'm a bitch, or he just say, go get my pistol and stuff like that, even though all of that rationalized and didn't go into it in that moment because it was just a moment, you know, like everything happened so fast. It wasn't nothing that was planned or thought out. It was just, you know, a fight, which I didn't want to get into. And, you know, with all of the, between the the ecstasy, the alcohol and everything that would happen, the exchange of words and stuff like that, it just was a you know, combination of things that kind of exploded into a, a bad situation. And, you know, I never meant for that to happen. You know, even though that's what happened, it was like I didn't have a hatred for that dude. It was a combination of things at that moment. And, you know, definitely sorry about it. So after the shooting took place, what was your next move that night? Oh, I got out of there, you know. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a shock for a moment after the event, the actual incident. And it was like, damn, what did I do? You know, after I kind of realized it, and 
I just ran. So, you know, of course the the, the series of events end up with me in Jersey for a little bit, which I um pretty much was trying to seek out what to do. I hollered at my pops, which was a great thing because I mean my father just he's passed away and that would be the last time that I got to see him. And um eventually the police found me in Lawrenceburg, North Carolina. How much time had passed from the shooting up until you were arrested in North Carolina? Well, the shooting happened on the 11th, well, the, in the mid, the morning of it, because, I mean, all of this stuff was like, I don't know. I mean, it says it in the transcript, but I keep forgetting that it had to be like 2 in the morning, 1 in the morning, I don't know. Um, and then they came and got me uh, December 30th. So just recently, it was exactly 11 years that I've been incarcerated to the day. How did your arrest go down? Was it peaceful or was it like a standoff or how did that go no, down? A, I mean, when the marshals come in and they got assault rifles pointing at you and they come into a house, I mean, I think you'll be a fool to try to buck or make it <laughs> anything that more than that. Because, I mean, the situation, like, it could have ended up with me dead. I mean, I didn't want to pose a threat or anything. So by the time they came through, because they came through it where my cousin stayed um, and was going through the house, I guess they got everybody out. And once I started hearing them say my name and things of that nature, I pretty much knew what it was. So I just, you know, pretty much came out and hit with my hands up. Because even in the house, it's dark. I didn't want to be somebody that got shot in the house just because, you know, somebody felt nervous with their finger on the trigger. So they went ahead, detained me, and took me to Scotland County. How did they track you down, being that you were in another state? I don't quite know, but at the time, um, because I couldn't really, I mean, they trying to cope with everything. I was drinking and smoking a lot and things of that nature, probably because of me using the phone or calling somebody that I shouldn't. So I can't really say. I never mm -hmm. got the answer to that. I wasn't really looking for the answer to it either. After you were arrested and charged, were you offered any type of plea deals while you were on trial? Yeah, my plea was 30 to 50 years or 40 years, which didn't sound like much of a deal to me at all. And, you know, part of the reason why I went to trial, like, at the time, I was, the time, I turned 25 in Howard County Detention Center three months before all of this happened. So to tell me to do 30 to 50 and not give me a set number, I couldn't fathom what 30 years of, of life was like. So, and that wasn't even an option. It was 30 to 50, which is like not telling me anything. You know, and then over 40 years, I just couldn't fathom it. I didn't know what I know now about good time and, you know, parole and stuff like that. Which any of that, none of that is a guarantee, you know, but it's just like, still, it wasn't much of a deal. Mm -hmm. I remember um, before trial one time, because I had a mistrial, uh, my attorney mm -hmm. coming to me. And he said something about a flat 30. And I asked him, I said, well, what about 25? And he was like, well, they're not going to take that. So we went to trial. And that's when we had the mistrial. But after the mistrial, because, I mean, they pretty much got to use things that they weren't able to use in the first trial, they had a sure enough, I guess, conviction or whatever. So they didn't come with any other plea, you know. It's lower, and I was hoping that it would be something better by the second trial, but that wasn't the case. How did you feel when you were convicted of first-degree murder and possession of a firearm, originally sentenced to life in prison, all suspended but 50 years? What was your reaction to that? Well, part of it was I felt relieved because first-degree murder could carry the death penalty. I mean, with the charges, if they would have been ran, consecutive, I could have had life plus 30. Um, so one of those things was a kind of relief that I actually had a number that I would be getting out, but still I didn't feel like what I did was premeditated. So it was, you know, very much conflicted. 
But I think things probably would have been different had I got sentenced to life versus, you know, what I did get sentenced because it still gave me hope. Like, when people had get sentenced to life in Maryland, especially with how things have been, only recently have they took the governor out of this situation. Life meant life. So I don't know too much about people getting back in court. And that's the whole thing about the whole judicial process is that people were ignorant to a lot of the things with the laws and such. So, I mean, me not knowing is a lot of what I felt in some cases was taken advantage of because what I've come to learn later is that with intoxication, it should have been second degree anyway. But, you know, still somebody lost their life. So to be worrying about the particulars of that stuff is something that just more so as far as me wanting to have my freedom and be there for my daughter and be present for my family. So how do you spend your time these days on a day-to-day basis? Well, as of now, like like I said, this is 11 years in. Um, right now, I'm working in MCE, which is Merlin Correctional Enterprise, which I am in the validation department, which we pretty much deal with the tags and stickers and stuff that goes on the, the um, license plates for Merlin. We're responsible for a lot of that stuff. I'm reading, constantly trying to figure out how I can promote and push my book, get some advocacy for, you know, just people investing in people. Um, I'm constantly writing people, trying to deal with my family, trying to reach out, promote uh, my poetry and my children's books so that people can actually see that there's still life in prison. There's people that's trying to do constructive things. There's, you know, in, in the case with me, um, mentoring and doing everything that I can, not only to rehabilitate myself, but also to help others. Like, that's pretty much what my life is about now, was building up myself and seeing how I can be of service. Do you have any of your poetry within arm's reach right now? Yes, sir. This one is called uh, R.C. Out of Beautiful. I see Purple Mountain Majesty. But the condition under I see them is a tragedy. I don't know why the caged bird sings, but I know of a caged man's dreams looking at razor wire glistening. There's peace and joy seen out my bar window, inspiring hope and praise to a heavenly hoax. Still there's violent flames of metal when my door closes that I can't open, hoping that host will let me someday go. Sooner than later, I'm in these books like they at the theater, showing me scenes of something greater, live culture lands. Vivid knowledge to let my horizon expand. And there's beautiful colors that stretch across that at the break of dawn, letting me know that there's more beyond, so just carry on. Carry on and execute, because happiness is my constitutional right to pursue. When I get through, through these bars, through these gates, through this time, this hurt, my hate, I see out of beautiful. Then there's um the one that I'll read, that I wrote October 16th, 2019 called Uncommon. Often on the compound, niggas will call me or say I look like Common. Even the CEOs will say, you look like that actor, not having knowledge of Common Sense the rapper. I occasionally tell people Common Sense ain't Common. Due to different backgrounds and point of views, people just don't think the same. I even feel like that about dude. The man they say I look like ain't Common. And here's what I'm saying. Dude came from the hood, became a B-boy, rapper, and made it to the silver screen. Moms made, moved me from the hood. I became a D-boy, sold crack, and left a murder scene. In my opinion, old boy is exceptional. You have done what he did, playing roles pa- opposite Paula Patton with her fine ass, having relationships with Erica and Serena with their beautiful, thick, bad asses, then having the good fortune to be part of hip-hop and cinema classics. That's uncommon. Being a black man in prison, that's common. Being a distributor and user of narcotics, that's common. Leaving a woman behind to raise a child, that's common. Using violence and leaving a mama crying, that's common. I guess that makes me a common motherfucker, a common nigga. So when they ask, do you know who you look like? I answer for them, common, wishing I could be in his place. Or like him, be doing something better. 
using my words, performing in shows, being in commercials and motion pictures. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that at all. I don't mind being said to look like common. I just mind being a common nigga. I'd rather be uncommon. So that was in my book, J.S. Russell, The Prison Poet, Live from the Pen. Is that a book that you have published that's like on Amazon and all these other places? Yes, sir. Um, as of right now, I have eight books published under either J.S. Russell or Jamar Russell. I don't have um, all of, I don't have access to the internet, so I don't really know how everything to get to them, but I do have the Instagram, J.S. Russell Writing Freedom, which should have some of that stuff in the bio or anything, but yeah, um, there's Writing Freedom from Within the Pen, um, Love Locked In, Writing Freedom in the Pen, Volume 2, the children's book is Malia's Daddy and the Magical Mashed Potatoes, um, there's poems from a prison church. There's J.S. Russell, the prison poet, live from the pen. And then there's Writing Freedom, Volume 3. And then another children's book, The Princess, The Dragon, and The Wizard, and The Golden Pump. That's quite a few books that you've penned all from behind bars. Pretty impressive. Well, my thing was to make sure that I'm being productive with this time. Like, you know, um... I want my freedom, and it's one of those things that I understand that I've committed a, a a crime, and it's like my freedom has been taken away, so it's like, why would anybody afford me the chance to go back? My thing was, in my thinking, because after I spoke to guys in here, they could just tell me how to do time good. They couldn't tell me how to get free. So, of course, I had to learn the law to figure out what ways I could possibly get back in court, but also rehabilitate myself and be attractive to anybody that wants to give me a second chance or to get give me any type of assistance. So, I mean, then there's the fact that if I get out, when I get out, excuse me, what would I be able to do? So taking all of this in consideration, I've had to invest in myself, you know, with the help of my family, loved ones, and things of that nature, be able to read and just make the most out of this time so that I'm not going out there stuff. Like, the recidivism rate is high in Maryland. I'm sure it pretty much is in the country as well, and that's because there's not a lot invested in people into their rehabilitation. Like, they just warehouse it here, but I didn't want to be somebody that gets another chance to freedom and, you know, don't know what to do with it. Speaking of rehabilitation, does the institution there offer any type of rehabilitation classes, and if so, have you taken any or continued continue your education for that matter since being incarcerated? Well, pretty much everything that they offered in this institution that I could take, I did from alternative to violence programs to um, thinking for a change to uh, NA or anything that I felt as though they could better me. I've taken the CDO class in here. I've taken business classes in here, self-publishing classes. Um, then I've also been a facilitator in Youth Challenge um, and, you know, other programs to try to help the youth, um, anything that I could be a part of, even with the guy here um, that has shared a lot of resources with me, um, Sean Gardner. Um, he had what's called the Behind the Wall Mentors, which can be seen on Instagram, BTW Mentors. You know, I try to do what I can, um, you know, We've actually, actually today I had received the State versus Us magazine was able to uh, read my article and I seen in there how he was even able to donate a $1,000 um, to Jamila T. Davis uh, with the back to school drive that they had there. So just try to deal with the right people and, you know, just continue to build and even when I've done all of the programs and they don't have anything going on now because of COVID and things have really got taken because of lack of staff. It's just books, books, and continue to read and learn and, you know, develop what I can do. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Um, well, we pretty much have said a whole <laughs> I've said a whole lot. Um, one of the things that I think that is huge, um, right now, 
like dealing with Merlin, they've been dealing with a lot of issues. They dealt with the juvenile issues where they would give them a juvenile life. You have guys that's here that have been in here for 30, 40 years. You know, it's things like that that just seem ridiculous because without the actual people that's able to help, and once people have done so much time, the numbers and the statistics are already there. Like, they have a lot of things for drug offenders, which they show that the recidivism rate is high, which those people, they need programs. They need type of solutions like that. But then they're also always against violent offenders, which they see also, the numbers are there, that the recidivism rate is low for violent offenders. However, there's a lot of time, and you can have a lot of guys in here that work on themselves. And the thing about prison is it can either, you can come in here and become better or you can come in here and become worse, you know, because it's just a microcosm of society, except for without access to the to a lot of the things that we can have to make us better. We don't have access to Internet technology and a lot of things to actually get help. But what we do have access to is a lot of things that can harm us. So... Those are the things that I would like for people to look into to start um, investing in people. Um, there was a program that I watched called it was either American Jail or U.S. Jail, and they highlighted a prison that was in Eastern Europe. I'm not sure if it was in Finland or where, but there was a lot of empty cells. And the woman said that's because from day one we we focus on rehabilitation. Like that's what that's what needs to be done here. And that's the thing that I want a lot of uh, people to, like, start looking into is helping people because people forget about us in here. Like, people look for mail, which snail mail may be outdated, don't really have the funds because you can't really survive off of what, you know, average person works for makes in here, you know. So it's just tough and depressing. So with that, you create a hostile situation. and. You know, people really need to start looking into investing in people and stop just thinking about the wrong that a person has done. Sure, everybody is not going to be the ideal human being, but they definitely won't be if some type of kindness or anything is not invested in them. So that's what I say. You know, if I can just start looking at really helping and doing things to help guys in here. That was my interview with Jamar Russell. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden truth. I'm 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 Unforbidden Truth. I'm Podcast. I'm 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 Unforbidden Truth. I'm Podcast.